So we're gonna start. Uh, so good morning, everyone. We had a grand round today, and uh, today's very special is because we have uh, first in-person grand rounds for almost over two years. Uh, it has been very difficult times, but uh, as a family in neurology, this is a special occasion because we are seeing uh, all of us together again in one room. Uh, so none of us are going to be virtually, but it's very important that there is uh, some like uh, in-person uh, meeting uh, within us. And we had the pleasure today uh, to also have a very uh, important speaker, uh, is Dr. Nancy Newman. So I just want to introduce her. I'm going to do something very short, uh, just trying to just make her to be the spotlight of the event. Uh, so Dr. Newman is the uh, Leo Deal Jolay Chair in the Ophthalmology and the Director of the Session of the Neuro Ophthalmology, Professor of Ophthalmology, Neurology, and Instructor in Neuro as uh, Neurological Surgery at Emory University School of Medicine. One important thing for uh, uh, Dr. Newman is that she has roots in New York. Uh, she is uh, from Huntington, New York. Uh, also, she has some uh, her uh, education, she went to Princeton, uh, then uh, she went to, for medical school, she went to Harvard residency and also uh, her fellowship in uh, neuroophthalmology. She moved to uh, Emory and she has, she has been there over uh, 30 years and she has a very successful career. She's a very uh, well established uh, uh, neurologist with a productive uh, academic uh, with over a 500 uh, publications between papers and books. And uh, other than that, uh, she's a wonderful educator. So we just had the fortune uh, to have her in the house. She actually uh, gets like some time uh, with the residents this morning running some cases. It was a very like uh, important for our residents to be able to have this time with her. So we welcome her, Dr. Uh, Newman. Thank you so much for coming to us. And uh, this is your moment for us. Thank you. Thanks very much and hello to all those on Zoom, but really hello, hello, hello to these in the audience. It's, I, it's a lot of years staring at uh, my own face in a rectangle and I just don't like it. So this is very, very special. I'm, I'm delighted to be here. So I thought since it's the beginning, is this okay? We're good? Yeah. Um, since this is the beginning of uh, hopefully a new era of you guys having in-person grand rounds. Um, I thought I'd start with a little of something for everybody. And so what I do is the an update in neuroophthalmology. And since neuroophthalmology is an anatomical specialty, um, that means that it's an... Hmm. So I can't advance with the clipboard. Do I advance with the mouse? Yeah. No, that doesn't work either. Uh, let's go to the next. Doesn't go like this. Yeah, no, it doesn't work on the keyboard. Oh. So I'll just use the mouse. Good. Since neuro, thank you. Since uh, neuroanatomy is a, it, it's ah. since neuroophthalmology is a, a neuroanatomical specialty, it means that an update on neuroophthalmology is an update on all of neurology, right? It's just an anatomic system of the brain. It's why I went into it, so I wouldn't have to focus on only one disease in neurology or set of diseases. I wanted to do all of neurologic disease. So I get to do that with neuroophthalmology. And just like any good neurologist, we're going to do it. We ask the question, where, then what, then now what? And so in this case, I'm going to approach the lecture the same way. We're going to do it anatomically. We're going to start in the eyeball. We're going to make our way back the optic nerve. We're going to segue with the uh, visual pathways in the brain, then the pupils, and then back via the efferent system, and then a few extra things. So it's going to be really, really fast. If it's not a topic that we happen to be discussing that you're interested in, just wait like two minutes and we'll be on to another topic. I hope to cover every disease that you all are interested in. And here we go. So um, we'll start in the eye. And the first uh, set of diseases we're going to talk about is acute retinal arterial ischemia. And that can be the mother of all ischemia to the eyes, the ophthalmic artery occlusion. It can be the central retinal artery. It can be branch retinal artery, or it can be transient monocular vision loss of retinal arterial origin. And although the visual outcomes of all these are completely 
different from each other, they have the same systemic implications. And why is that? Well, you know that better than anyone because they are all uh, occur because of problems with the anterior circulation to the brain, the carotid circulation. And so they have the same mechanisms and causes as cerebral ischemia. And there are 12 articles in the past decade that I would suggest you all don't miss because they're very, very important. Um, I can, I'm gonna summarize them all for you. It's remarkable. They come from all over the world. They look at the same thing, which is basically if you come in with retinal arterial ischemia of any sort, what is your risk on brain MRI of having DWI positive silent infarctions, okay? And the summary is that up to 37% of patients with CRAO or BRAO, 18% of patients with just transient monocular vision loss um, will have a positive DWI MRI. And if you do that DWI MRI within 48 hours of vision loss, you identify a subgroup of patients who are at extremely high risk of subsequent stroke. And you don't know that subset unless you do the DWI MRI. And so who sees these patients? It's not you. It's not you who see them right away. It is the eye care specialist who see these patients right away because the patients themselves are not savvy enough to know to come to the ED usually. And so we have for the past four or five years been valiantly trying to teach the ophthalmologist and the optometrist that acute retinal ischemia is an emergency. And that, you know, and it's been somewhat easier to convince them that a CRAO or a BRAO equals a stroke, but it's been a lot harder to explain to them that transient monocular vision loss of, of arterial, uh, retinal arterial origin and a DWA, DWI positive MRI is also the equivalent of a stroke. And we don't know who's gonna be positive unless they get that DWI MRI within 24 to 48 hours. Um, we've made some headway. There are now guidelines uh, for CRAO, BRAO, and ophthalmic artery occlusions for the retina specialists that say these patients should be immediately sent to the nearest stroke center for prompt assessment so they can figure out who's at risk for subsequent stroke and who needs to be put on uh, preventive measures right away. Um, we're working on it. Um, the other reason potentially for getting them in early to an ED is that at some point we may actually have a treatment for acute retinal arterial ischemia, such as CRAO. Uh, right now, uh, the idea of using thrombolysis, either intravenous or intraarterial, has not been proven to be successful, but the studies have been within 24 hours, not within the typical stroke window that you all know and love. And so there are now three trials ongoing in Europe trying to get these patients in within four and a half hours and treat them with um, IV thrombolysis. And so in the hope that this may prove to be helpful, we need to get these patients in early. So what are we telling the eye care specialists and what should you know they're being told? We're, we're telling them to establish a network with the closest stroke center to them and the local stroke neurologist so that they make the correct diagnosis. If they make the correct diagnosis, they should send the patient immediately to a stroke center where they are the patient is told they've had a stroke of the eye and that should trigger the right the appropriate uh, investigative management. If it's not acute, we're suggesting meaning like outside of a week, they should talk to the stroke neurologist in advance or at the time to know what to do with these patients. All right, other retina findings. These findings, what we call retinal vascular changes, are chronic changes. They're not an acute CRAO or BRAO. They've been known for years, and in big population studies, such as the ARIC study, the Blue Mountain study, retinal photography was taken at baseline and then followed. And these are very subtle findings that you're not going to really see on your, your fundoscopic examination. But it turns out that they are highly, highly 
um, associated with stroke and recurrent stroke, cognitive impairment and dementia, peripheral vascular disease, cardiovascular disease and death, and renal failure. And at this point, they are not something you can do in your office and predict. However, what's going to change that is artificial intelligence and deep learning. And pretty soon, just like the endocrinologists have you know, a, an algorithm for their diabetic patients and for the, the, the bone scans and things, and they've just put in the numbers and it comes out with the risk, this is going to be happening soon. Basically, you there already are cameras in um, PCP's offices for diabetic retinopathy to do this kind of AI. There's going to be this. They're going to be, show you who is at risk for uh, cardiovascular and cerebrovascular events and death. So I think this is coming down the pike. But can we use retinal photography uh, in the day-to-day -day patient clinical assessment? How can it help us? Um, and this, I talked a bit to the residents this morning about this. Um, this was a series of studies that was sponsored uh, by the National Institutes of Health that we did at Emory. It's called the PHOTOD study, standing for Fundus Photography versus Ophthalmoscopy Trial Outcomes in the Emergency Department. And basically, uh, this was the result of new great technology, which has allowed for cameras that can take exquisite pictures like you see here on this slide within patients who are undilated. They do not have dilation. And these are the pictures you see of the back of the eye. It takes three minutes to take these pictures, uh, less than three minutes actually to take these pictures. And a person could be trained in the use of these cameras in less than 10 minutes. And this is a, a non-ophthalmic Techno technologically trained person. Uh, and as you can imagine, it reveals unrecognized findings uh, in these patients. Uh, we've shown that it's feasible. We've shown that you can do it in patients who are as young as two years old. Uh, all they have to do is sit on a parent's lap and put their head in the, in the, the uh, camera. And we've shown that these photographs can easily be transmitted to smartphones. Um, and what did these tr this trial show? So there were three phases to the study. In the first phase, um, any patient whose clinical complaint uh, was felt to should warrant a fundoscopic examination. I'd love it if we're done on every patient, but the ones that warrant it should be patients who come in with headache, vision loss, neurologic symptoms, or extremely elevated blood pressure. Right, we all would agree with that. They should have a fundus exam, um, and so we would take. If that were the chief complaint, these patients would have these pictures taken. Uh, in the first phase of the study, the ED docs were uh, not allowed access to the photographs. In the second phase of the study, they were allowed access to the photographs, um, and. It, we looked for what were called relevant findings, findings like you see here in the picture that would have changed the patient's management in the emergency department. And there, the number of relevant findings over the three phases was actually 12%. So it's not that rare, one in nine uh, uh, patients. Um, and this, these relevant findings in the first phase when the ED docs were looking themselves, uh, none of them were found. In the second phase, when the ED docs had access to the photographs, they actually identified the relative fi relevant findings in almost 50% of cases. And more importantly, in 80% of cases of normal photographs, the ED docs were able to say, this is normal, and then go ahead and dis discharge the patient appropriately. So this is very important technology. Um, and but it still leaves the issue of, I think everyone would agree that the ophthalmoscope hanging in a bay in the ED is useless. Uh, and therefore having access to a camera. And as I was telling the residents this morning, within five years, I think the kind of camera we're talking about to be able to take pictures through, through non-dilated pupils will be attachments to smartphones or tablets. And, and it, they'll be beautiful. 
Um, but it still means that the ED provider or neurologist in the clinic uh, still has to decide what to do with the finding, um, can, can still consult ophthalmology if they're not sure, um, or can even send it uh, virtually to an ophthalmologist if they're not sure. But, you know, that's, it, it raises medical legal issues, it raises billing issues, it raises, you know, how can an ophthalmologist decide what's on a photo without having the clinical information. And so how can we make that better? And once again, um, I think it's going to be better uh, via artificial intelligence, Mr. Robot. And if you think that that's futuristic, then you haven't looked at the uh, fact that deep learning is really about to change everything in ophthalmology for sure, and probably neurology. And we had the lead article of the New England Journal of Medicine in April of 2020 that should ring a bell for what was happening in New York in April of 2020, despite we, the fact that we had a lead article in the New England with a editorial about it uh, from our work in AI, uh, being able to recognize papilledema on these photographs, uh, it was COVID time. And so it kind of got buried uh, and it got lost for a couple of years. We're, we're coming back. Um, the reality is we have developed with a group in Singapore, uh, a algorithm that can diagnose papilledema, not just disc edema, but specifically disc edema due to elevated intracranial pressure from photographs, single photographs without any clinical information. And the machine does it as well if not even a little better than two expert neuro-ophthalmologists, myself, one of them. So it's amazing. And if you'd like to see what it does, you basically you forget the ophthalmoscope, you take a picture, you get these pictures, you put it into the algorithm, which is called Bonsai for brain and optic nerve uh, study group. And you get this, you get a probability of whether it's papilledema, normal, or other abnormality of the optic nerve. And would that not be helpful to you uh, in your clinic and in the ED? So I think this is the future and it's just the issue of uh, getting it into practice. And if you think, well, that's again, not gonna happen. Think about the EKG machine that you guys use all the time, right? You don't listen to the heart sounds anymore and you don't, you don't interpret the EKG yourself. It has an interpretation by a deep learning system. So that's no different here. It's a diagnostic aid. It helps you in your overall clinical assessment. And so it also begs the question, not should we stop teaching ophthalmoscopy to neurology residents, to medical students, but when, I think is really the question. When are we finally going to make the transition enough that technology has helped us enough? All right, so let's move on to optic neuropathies. I think that's uh, uh, entities that are more comfortable with the neurology audience. And let's start with a specific optic neuropathy called papilledema that happens from elevated intracranial pressure. And because it's due to elevated intracranial pressure, it's classically bilateral. It comes from elevated pressure from any cause. Um, and the difference between papilledema optic neuropathy versus most of the optic, other optic neuropathies that you guys deal with is that instead of involving central vision preferentially, giving you central scotomas or central defects in the field, it involves the peripheral vision first. So the patient is usually unaware of a problem until it gets so toward the center that you're very late in the disease. And what's interesting is the only other optic neuropathy that really does that is the other pressure optic neuropathy, glaucoma. Same thing, spare central visual acuity involves the periphery first. Why is that? Maybe one of you can answer that for me someday. Okay, papilledema causes can be anything that causes elevated intracranial pressure. There are the things that you see on MRI, such as hydrocephalus or a mass lesion. And then there are things that you can pick up with an MRV such as venous sinus thrombosis or via lumbar puncture such as a meningeal 
process. And if you rule those all out, you're left with idiopathic intracranial hypertension. So the algorithm for patients who, in whom you see what you expect to be papilledema has to include neuroimaging, has to have an LP, and then the CSF has to be normal. And to give the diagnosis of IIH, you have to have a pressure of 25 centimeters of water or greater. And IIH nowadays is not really a diagnosis of exclusion like I just showed, it has positive findings. So of course the positive findings should be papilledema. You really are at your peril to make the diagnosis of IIH without documented papilledema at some point in that patient's course. You need the MRI and you need an MRV to rule out venous sinus thrombosis. And the CSF needs to be normal. And you need the LP, not only to document the high pressure and to prove that CSF is normal. Remember, obesity is rampant. There are a lot of people who look like an IIH patient, but they have syphilis, syphilitic meningitis. And we find that if we do the CSF analysis. And finally, the LP starts treatment it lowers the pressure. And even though it lowers it for just a certain amount of time, it sets up a leak, it can lower it for quite some time. It lowers the hydraulics and it drops it. So it's a very important uh, thing to do. And IIH is everywhere. It's everywhere there are obese people and there are no greater incidence and prevalence of obesity than in the United States of America. Uh, and it's getting worse. New England Journal of Medicine articles in 2019 has predicted that in 2030, so that's only eight years from now, over 50% of the United States adult population will be obese, not just overweight, but obese. So the incidence and of IIH is increasing at the same rate as the incidence of obesity. So how do you know, you know, most patients who have IIH have a fairly benign course. I mean, it, the Brits used to call it benign intracranial hypertension. It's not really benign in everybody. They can have visual field defects and some patients can really have up to 20, 25% of patients can have some form of vision limiting uh, outcome. So how do you predict amongst the patients you first see with IIH, you've made the diagnosis, how do you predict those who you may, may need to follow more closely or those you may need to treat more aggressively? And over the years, we've come up with a number of patient demographic characteristics as well as clinical findings that should be red flags for you that these patients need special attention, need to be followed more closely. And what do they include? They, in the United States, they include black race. Now it's, it's very interesting. The first thing might be, there could be problems with access to care or inequalities in, in treatments. Um, the reality is that these studies have shown that this is beyond that. This is outside of that. And frankly, black race patients do worse with the other pressure optic neuropathy, glaucoma. So there is probably something about the optic nerve that makes them more susceptible. Male gender, we know that women get IIH far more likely, nine to one than men, but when they do get it, their visual prognosis is worse. Severe obesity, not just a BMI over 30, but a BMI of over 40, visual prognosis worse, probably related to higher CSF pressures. Systemic abnormalities in addition to IIH, such as anemia, sleep apnea, hypertension, these patients do worse. Bad vision the first time you see them. Vision loss at presentation, and I'm not talking about central acuity, although if that's involved, they're really bad. I'm talking about visual fields. And the only way to follow these patients, as you see on your right, is with visual field testing that is formal, automated, computerized perimetry, partner with an ophthalmologist or a neuro-ophthalmologist. 
And finally, a rapid onset or fulminant course. So what's the treatment for IIH? As we mentioned, the diagnostic lumbar puncture actually starts treatment. Acetazolamide has been shown in doses as high as four grams a day. I usually don't go over two to three grams a day. Um, can decrease um, disc edema. Topiramate can help with the headaches. Treat those risk factors. And then weight loss is the mainstay. And what I tell my patients, because you know we're talking about patients who are 300 pounds or more, you tell them go lose weight. It's really not very helpful. What I tell them is that it has been shown that even loss of just 10% of their body weight will reverse this disease. So for a 300 pound person, we're talking about losing only 30 pounds, not 150 pounds. And the flip side of that is that they gain only 10% back, they'll have a recurrence. But I find it much more manageable for these patients to give them that kind of goal. And then here's what matters most probably for the neurologist is that headaches become chronic in 50% of these patients. It's as if the high pressure triggers something in the susceptible patient that even when you reduce the pressure and the papilledema goes away, at least half of these patients will be left with chronic headaches that need your help and your treatment. So you predict the prognosis by following automated perimetry and the appearance of the fundus, and then you have surgical options. Your surgical options include a CSF shunting procedure. Most often people are now doing, the neurosurgeons are now doing VP shunting more than LP shunting. You have optic nerve sheath fenestrations if vision loss is threatened. Um, bariatric surgery is something to consider for the long run. And then you have the new kid on the block, which is stenting, venous sinus stenting. Um, how do you do it here? It's very, very, uh, very fashionable at Cornell um, to do venous sinus stenting. And frankly, you know what? You treat these patients with the services you have. If you have people who can do fenestrations, you do them. If you have people who can do shunting, you do them. If they have people who do stenting, you can do them. And basically the principle of venous sinus stenting is that nearly 100% of patients with elevated intracranial pressure from any cause, but certainly an IIH, will have noticeable narrowing of the distal transverse venous sinus. So it's stenoses, not thromboses. And initially it was questioned, well, maybe that's the cause of IIH, but it's been also shown that if you do a lumbar puncture in many of these patients, that these stenoses open up, suggesting that it's extrinsic compression by the elevated intracranial pressure causing, causing the stenosis. No matter what's causing it, it if, if there's a gradient there, it will contribute to the elevation of intracranial pressure. So the argument for stenting is that you put in a stent and you break that vicious cycle. And it probably does result in the pressure coming down and in papilledema coming down. My problem is that we have no long-term data on the complications of this. You, you're putting a stent in a vein, a vein can clot. Um, we're also talking about putting stents in people who are going to have those stents in their head for maybe eight, 40, 50, 60 more years right? In their 20s, their teens. So who knows what the safety is? And so for me, I tend to try to avoid it, but I, I know it is an option out there. So my take-home message for that is transverse venous steno sinus stenosis is very common in IH, nearly universal, depending on how you measure it. And there is no association between the loca location, presence, or severity of the transverse venous sinus stenosis and the clinical course of IIH. So don't treat the MRI, treat the patient. Let's move on to a different optic neuropathy, optic neuritis, inflammation of the optic nerve. The typical demyelinating optic neuritis is a female autoimmune disease, young person, it's an itis, there's pain and eye movement, two thirds of cases retrobulbar, so the optic nerve looks normal acutely, one third of cases anterior, so you'll see swelling of the optic nerve, 
almost all of them will have some spontaneous improvement, usually about two or three weeks after onset. And of course, it's associated with multiple sclerosis. And typical optic neuritis, the optic neuritis treatment trial showed us that whether you treat them with steroids or not, there will be no difference in their visual function at six months or one year, but intravenous steroids accelerated the recovery by about up to three weeks in comparison. Oral steroids at one milligram per kilogram dosage not only didn't accelerate recovery and certainly didn't affect the outcome, but doubled the risk of recurrence in either eye. And so you really are at your peril doing that kind of treatment for patients with typical optic neuritis. Uh, what the extended optic neuritis treatment trial showed us, which was then uh, confirmed by multiple subsequent studies, is that the brain, baseline brain MRI is the most important and best predictor of who is going to develop clinically definite multiple sclerosis with nearly 75% of patients who had one or more brain lesions at baseline uh, developing clinically definite MS at 15 years and about 25% uh, of those who had a normal baseline MRI. So most important. The other thing that the optic neuritis treatment trial showed us is that it still is important to uh, be humble about your abilities to look in the back of the eye partner with an ophthalmologist because there are certain characteristics in patients with a normal baseline MRI. Remember, uh, an abnormal base baseline MRI trumps everything. But if you have a normal baseline MRI, if you have any of the following, no pain, no light perception vision, meaning really bad vision, severe disc edema like you see here, hemorrhagic disc edema, or retinal exudates, especially in a star, none of these patients get clinically definite MS. This is a different disease, okay? The two new kids on the block, aquaporin-4 uh, antibodies, not so new anymore. We used to say, oh, oh, get them, suspect that disease when the patient has a bilateral optic neuritis, a severe optic neuritis, a no recovery optic neuritis, or recurrent optic neuritis, since it changes management tremendously. Remember, interferons can actually make NMO worse. Um, it changes how you treat these patients. We now recommend obtaining aquaporin-4 antibodies in all cases of optic neuritis, even the most typical. And I can show you examples where we've been burned if we did not. The other kid, the newer kid is MOG antibodies. Again, you can get it because it is more often bilateral and more often recurrent. Um, these patients more often will have disc edema with these little wrinkles. You see those little wrinkle lines here. Um, their MRIs will show sheath enhancement in addition to optic nerve enhancement. That's the, the key, the, the red flag that it's MOG. But again, we get MOG antibodies in every patient with optic neuritis because it likely will change their management or at least will, maybe not their treatment, but it may change their, uh, the way they're followed going forward. Um, OCT, you guys uh, beginning to hear a lot about optical coherence tomography. Uh, there are two studies that relate to the optic nerve. There's the retinal nerve fiber layer thickness. This is, they measure the thickness around the optic nerve opening. And then the newer one is the ganglion cell where they actually measure the layer of just cell bodies because remember the nerve fiber layer parts so that the fovea only has the ganglion cells in front of them. So the ganglion cell layer is a measure of the cell bodies and the RNFL is a measure of the axons which are becoming the optic nerve. And we first used OCT in neurology pretty much for multiple sclerosis um, and it correlated findings on the RNFL correlated with axonal loss, with visual dysfunction and with brain atrophy in MS, disability and quality of life. But the GCC really has changed everything and is used even more often. And that where we tend to use OCT the most in um, neuro-ophthalmology is actually to help the neurosurgeons both diagnostically and management-wise with compressive and infiltrative causes of optic neuropathy. In particular, as you see here, pituitary tumors compressing the chiasm or optic nerves. 
And so it's really great what the ganglion cell analysis has done. You see this bitemporal hemianopia as well as left eye, uh, left optic nerve involvement from this tumor pressing on both the chiasm and over here, the uh, prechiasmal optic nerve. And this is what their ganglion cell analysis looks like with nasal loss in the right eye going along with the temporal field loss and nasal loss plus superior ganglion cell loss in the left eye going along with the temporal loss and the inferior visual field loss in the left eye. And all you have to do is turn those, those uh, printouts upside down and backwards and look, you've got an absolute identical mirror of the visual field defect because remember the RFL is around the optic nerve, the GCC, the ganglion cell analysis will be right down the fovea, which is the vertical meridian, which you know and love. And so it really looks exactly like the, uh, the visual fields. So um, the GCC is more sensitive than the RNFL and even visual field testing. Look at this. This is a patient that the neurosurgeon says, you know, the patient's not a great surgical candidate. Is this tumor causing anything? And in the past, we would have gotten the field and say, no, looks pretty good. We would have gotten the OCT RNFL. We would have said, no, looks pretty good. Look at the GCC, already binasal loss. And so indeed, this is early uh, involvement. The GCC will change in about three to four weeks. The RNFL will change in about six weeks. Um, and so it's earlier and more sensitive. Um, but we still need visual field testing. Look at this tumor here up against the chiasm, visual field defect, normal optic nerves on fundus exam, normal RNFL and normal GCC. Why is that? Because it takes a few weeks to become abnormal. This is pituitary apoplexy. So it just happened acutely. So you have to know the limitations of the studying. Let's quickly talk about vascular optic neuropathy. We have anterior ischemic optic neuropathy, which is the most common. Uh, vascular optic neuropathy, because it's anterior, you see swelling of the front of the optic nerves. It's a small vessel disease. You don't need to get carotid studies for this. It's not embolic. Um, it causes permanent vision loss and it's associated with giant cell arteritis. So you always have to ask those questions about GCA and get the appropriate markers. The non-arteritic form occurs in patients who have a small crowded optic nerve, the so-called disc at risk. Uh, no, so you see the cup here in a normal optic nerve. You see how small and crowded it is here. That is the substrate, and that's why mostly Caucasians will get non arteritic AION. Uh, versus optic neuritis, we did this for the residents this morning. It's an important differential diagnosis because although optic neuritis is typically in younger patients, AION typically in older patients, you can have young patients with NAION. And so if you have a painless anterior optic neuropathy, please make sure you consider the diagnosis. 23% of our NAION patients were under the age of 50, despite knowing that this is a referral bias, but it still happens. And so the when you have a misdiagnosed optic neuritis, it's most likely to be that it was a misdiagnosed, a missed non-arteritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy. Um, so we care a lot to make that diagnosis, and so it's important. Um, three other things to remember with NAION. I wish I had a treatment for you. We do not. There is no proven treatment for this disease, um, but there are three associations that you should know about so that you can at least counsel your patients and perhaps help uh, prophylax against the other eye being involved. First of all, there is a definite association with obstructive sleep apnea. Secondly, there is an increased incidence uh, amongst patients who have recently used the performance enhancing drugs such as uh, Viagra and Cialis. And thirdly, um, NAION is, can be precipitated or there is an NAION-like optic neuropathy with drugs such a, with the drug amiodarone. So you need to make sure you look at the medication list. I can't talk about anterior ischemic optic neuropathy without bringing up giant cell arteritis. You have to rule out giant cell arteritis in all patients 
uh, over the age of 50 with ischemic optic neuropathies. Um, and remember systemic symptoms and even elevation of the markers can be absent uh, in these patients. Consider this if there's been a prior transient vision loss or transient diplopia, um, and you need to treat with steroids emergently and then get a TA biopsy. Um, there are several treatments now that can be used to spare steroids. They are not acute treatments of GCA. They are meant to spare the amount of steroid burden in these patients. Remember, most of these patients will require two years of oral steroids uh, before they can fully get off them with the use of tocilizumab. Hopefully, we can reduce that to maybe one year of being on steroids. So very important. Um, Toxic nutritional optic neuropathies, I'm just gonna give you the list. Things to always remember for toxic optic neuropathies. Ethambutol, still the most common cause. Uh, often patients in prison being treated with for, for TB. Uh, linozolide, not used very much, cystic fibrosis patients. Checkpoint inhibitors are the new ones. Uh, amiodarone, we mentioned, PD-5 inhibitors uh, can precipitate AION methanol and ethylene glycol, toluene. And then if someone's at a hip replacement in the early 2000s, some of those joints have disintegrated causing uh, cobalt chromium toxicity to the optic nerve. So historical aspects, very important. Just a quick uh, talk about the hereditary optic neuropathies. You don't see them very often. Um, you do see labors hereditary optic neuropathy which is a mitochondrial DNA uh, disease because it often gets misdiagnosed as optic neuritis. Um, you hardly ever see autosomal dominant optic neuropathy. It's a insidious onset usually in the first decade of life. These kids fail their um, uh, vision exam in school and they get to an ophthalmologist, but more and more we're seeing people showing up in their 40s, 50s, because they are failing their driver's license and they've just crossed over from like 2050 vision to 2060. So that's dominant optic atrophy. Both of these disorders are disorders of mitochondrial function because even DOA, the gene codes for a protein necessarily necessary for mitochondrial function. Remember 90% of the proteins necessary for mitochondrial function are coded for in the nucleus and make their way uh, into the mitochondria. Uh, the labors, uh, bilateral, sequential, central vision loss, usually males, uh, but females can have it, usually ages 15, age 15 to 35, but as young as age one, as old as age 87, having vision loss. They get this optic neuropathy, they, their nerves can look kind of hyperemic and a little swollen. They develop pallor later and they're related to point mutations in mitochondrial DNA and therefore it's inherited maternally. Someone with labors cannot pass it on to their kid. Um, what are some treatment options uh, for labors? I wanna point out um, two, a couple. So we don't have anything that can cure it as of right now. The one thing your patient will ask you about is idebinone. Idebinone is like a super coenzyme Q10. It penetrates the blood brain barrier better. Um, it is not FDA approved in this country. It is EMA approved in Europe for the treatment of labors. The patients will get it off the internet because it's just kind of like a super vitamin. Uh, it's safe uh, and it may indeed help within the first one to two years of labors. It's not the penicillin for labors, but they will talk to you about it. And then there's gene therapy. And what are two gene therapies that I just wanna make you aware of? So the first is called nuclear transfer techniques. And then the second is allotopic rescue. So nuclear transfer techniques is this new technology in which you take a donor egg that has mutant mitochondrial DNA, you extract the nucleus and you put it in a donor cytoplasm egg from which the nucleus has been extracted and you get this composite egg, which you do in vitro fertilization with the partner's sperm. And then you get a baby that is nuclear DNA, mom and dad, 
but donor mitochondrial DNA, so-called three parent child. And again, if you think this is futuristic, then you don't read the scientific journal. It's called the New York Times and the Washington Post. And this is from 2016. This little boy is six years old. He does not have labors. He has something called NARP, the 8993 mutation, which is a point mutation in mitochondrial DNA, where a US doctor went to Mexico to help this Jordanian couple conceive a baby with three genetic parents. Um, in the UK, this is done. Uh, on a case-by-case -case basis in this country, it is not allowed ethically. Um, I think that's sad personally. Okay. Um, I'm not sure that labor's families would do this. Uh, they may surprise you that they would. Uh, certainly those patients who are carrying uh, a very severe point mutation mitochondrial DNA diseases like NARP have, have elected to do so. Allotopic rescue is the only thing gene therapy wise that has been done uh, for labor's patients who are not uh, eggs um, and actual patients. And it works on the basis of, we know that we can insert DNA into the nucleus. We know we can do that. We cannot insert DNA into all the mitochondria. So what we do is we take advantage of the fact that since 90% of the proteins necessary for mitochondrial function are coded for on nuclear genes made in the cytoplasm on endoplasmic reticulum have a targeting sequence which tell them to go into the mitochondria. How about we put genetically engineered uh, complementary normal gene that's involved in labors into the nucleus with that same kind of targeting sequence which will tell the machinery to get it into the mitochondria. And this has been shown to work in animal studies and has been shown to work, has been shown to be safe and has been performed in multiple gene therapy trials all over the world in labors. So let's look at those results. So these are for the first two studies called rescue and reverse uh, treating patients with labors with vision loss within one year. And the first thing to note is that there is indeed an improvement uh, in the eyes after the nadir that would not be expected from the natural history of the disease, which you see charted here. But what is striking is that both eyes improved. One eye was injected, one eye had a sham injection, yet both eyes improved. So you say, well, maybe we didn't know the natural history after all. Maybe there is some improvement in this disease, but it really didn't fit. So we did monkey studies. And we show that when you inject DNA into one eye of a monkey and then sacrifice them at three months and at six months, you find the vector DNA in the opposite eye retina and in the opposite optic nerve, suggesting that there may be transfer of the product to the other side. Of course, that means that all the studies we designed were wrongly designed because we all designed them to have internal controls that would use the uninjected eye as the internal control. And we had already started the, th the third study, which was bilateral injection, which was required by the FDA since it's a bilateral disease. And we gave every patient who's the first eye involved injection into that eye, they all got it. And then the patients were randomized to get an injection in their second eye or a sham injection in their second eye, an actual placebo injection, not sham, a real placebo injection in the second eye. And again, as you can see from the graph, all eyes improved, but the eyes in patients who got bilateral injections of gene therapy did better than the eyes of those patients who received only unilateral injection of gene therapy, showing that it really isn't the natural history that there's even a dose effect when you give the drug. Now, this is a very modest improvement. This is not the penicillin for this disease and whether the expense of gene therapy is worth what the patients will get from it, that's a whole nother question. And indeed, these kind of trials would not be possible. And for all of you who deal with rare diseases, these kind of trials would not be possible without this patient support group and patient network group. And that's what you really have to work with. It's very powerful. We were able to enroll nearly 200 patients within two years 
of a rare disease because a click of the mouse got us these people. So this is very, very important stuff. So let's segue back into the brain. It's devastating when someone has a homonymous hemianopia. It's usually from a posterior cerebral artery stroke. Um, and what, what can we tell these patients? Well, first of all, there usually is some degree of recovery. Uh, if it's going to happen, it does so usually in the first two to three weeks, and it's pretty much done by three months. So certainly by six months, if they have not improved, they're not gonna improve any further than that. So that's the first thing. What can we do for these patients? Well, there are all sorts of training stuff going out there. It's questionable whether there's enough plasticity for that to help. But this, I think, is really going to revolutionize what you see in front of you is going to revolutionize things for people with field defects. Now, this was done specifically for patients with severe glaucoma. And so you see down here, this is the defect that a patient would have in one eye from glaucoma. And what this technology does, because this is what they would see of this scene if they were looking at it with that eye. It, it's a goggle thing, it's a little cumbersome, but it takes a picture of the whole scene and then truncates it to put the whole scene into the patient's intact visual field. And you could imagine you could do the same with a homonymous hemianopia. Like I say, it's cumbersome right now, but I think that this is going to be very helpful in the future for people who have devastating uh, visual field abnormalities. Pupils, what's new with the pupil? Well, I think by now, hopefully you guys have thrown away the cocaine. Uh, you're not testing Horner syndrome with cocaine in your office anymore, unless you deal with babies where you still need to if they're a year uh, old or younger, because the, the new person is apraclonitine. Uh, it's a glaucoma drop called iopidine. It has weak uh, alpha adrenergic action. So it actually ends up in reversing the ptosis and the anisocoria, as you can see here with the Horner, um, it basically relies on supersensitivity of a deaforated de um, uh, end organ, and it makes the ptosis go up, and it makes that pupil actually get bigger than the normal pupil. And you can just partner with your glaucoma people, ask them to get you a little bottle of it. It's very, very helpful for diagnosing a Horner and you don't need cocaine. So this is the way we do it. Third nerve palsies, anything new with third nerve palsies? Well, of course the most dreaded uh, cause of a third nerve palsy would be the posterior communicating artery aneurysm. And as we talked about with the residents today, we get nearly 100% sensitivity with either CTA or MRA for aneurysms that would be big enough to cause a third nerve palsy. So you should be fine. There should be no problem with diagnosis. And yet we're missing, people are missing the, the aneurysms. Why are they missing aneurysms in patients with third nerve palsy? In this study, we showed that it was not the software, it was not the hardware, it was the brainware. So first of all, the the um, scan never missed it. It was the radiologist who missed it. And why did the radiologist miss it? Number one, the radiologist was not told what to look for. So you have to communicate with the radiologist. The radiologist was not a neuroradiologist. So they did not have the expertise in looking at, for example, in CTAs or MRAs, the, re the, the source images which is a way you can pick up on an aneurysm. And so the, patient, the radiologist had no expertise in vascular disease. So the take home message is know your radiologist, know where you're sending people for these kind of evaluations and look at it yourself if you feel more comfortable. I promised something for every disease. So I'll talk about Parkinson's briefly. There's been a lot of uh, literature lately on Parkinson's and even Alzheimer's and showing that there's ganglion cell loss on OCT and there's receptor loss and all this stuff. And maybe that's related to visual compromise. The reality is that's wonderful science and it might even give you end results in, in uh, clinical trials, but that's not 
what makes a patient with Parkinson's not see well. A patient with Parkinson's doesn't see well because of ophthalmic problems. And what are those ophthalmic problems? They have difficulty moving their eyes into bifocals or even worse when they have these um, uh, monovision or uh, progressive lenses. They can't get their eyes to go into the, the a perfect place to see. Number two, they have convergence insufficiency. Number three, they have blepharitis. Uh, and number four, they don't blink, so they have dry eye. All these things can be helped by an ophthalmologist. You give them single vision glasses, one for distance, one for reading. Um, you put prisms in their reading glasses for their convergence insufficiency. You treat their dry eye syndrome, you treat their blepharitis, and you reassure them that they're not going blind from their Parkinson's. So very, very important. Um, last, second to last slide here on diagnostic error. This is a very important topic these days. Um, and neuro-ophthalmologists really help with diagnostic error. So they, this is, this, we, we're, we're good for something. Um, we make the right diagnosis. We help you make the right diagnosis. And, and finally, although this is a somewhat old study that we did a while ago, um, it's the sunglasses sign. So those of you, especially who are epileptologists or pediatric neurologists, you know about the teddy bear sign. The teddy bear sign is that if a patient comes in, especially if they are not a small child, carrying a stuffed animal to their overnight EEG recording, they have a higher likelihood of having non-epileptic seizures. Um, and so we had noticed the same thing with patients coming into our examination room, which has no windows, uh, wearing sunglasses. Uh, and we called it the sunglasses sign, and it's a very high correlation with non-organic vision loss. Um, and so it helps you when, that, when you see someone come in like that, that you know you wanna start at the bottom of the eye chart, you wanna maybe place some obstacles in their way if they're saying they can't see and they step around them. It's a different way of approaching a patient and um, I, I think it, it relates. So in conclusion, what should we look for next year? Um, I think AI is gonna really uh, show us some diagnostic aids that will be very helpful. Ocular fundus photography, as we discussed, OCT, perhaps in the degenerative diseases, and there are ongoing clinical trials for IIH for stenting. Uh, we'll probably see more clinical trials for the treatment of MOG, labors, and hopefully thrombolysis for central retinal artery occlusion. So um, my take home message, I hope you really try. I know your, your chairman isn't with you here today and I know you lost your neuro-ophthalmologist from ophthalmology, Valerie Elmelon left a several years ago. So please try to include a neuro-ophthalmologist in your practice or in your department. I think we can uh, provide a whole lot of help with a whole lot of stuff. So thank you very much. And I really enjoyed having an audience. It's great, thanks. Questions? Yeah. Oh, yes, uh, IH. Do we have any idea as to why one gets raised intracranial pressure when there's no hydrocephalus, uh, there's normal venous circulation? Uh, I've, there's this new theory of uh, uh, lymphatics yeah. that you have so a passage a through, the, uh, yeah. through the astrocytes, and that's where the extracellular fluid yeah. may uh, so, accumulate. Is so there anything the, to this? Yeah, so the short answer is no, we don't know. Um, mm -hmm. The long answer is there are multiple theories, including elevated venous pressure, including differences in the microvilli, including potentially intrinsic uh, stenosis of the venous sinuses. And as you point out, there's a whole lot of work going on with lymphatics, as well as other things such as hormonal things, such as fat cells having hormonal things. Mm. Nobody has been able to show why it is. It would have to account for why obesity, which doesn't really fit with the lymphatic thing, why mostly women, and that's what's pushed the hormonal side of things, but we do not know. Okay, thank you. Yeah. 
Thank you, Dr. Newman, very much for this very nice lecture and comprehensive. I have a question regarding the therapy for hemianopsias. There is this uh, treatment that has been approved by FDA, I think, for over probably 10, 15 years, the Nova Vision treatment based on this yeah. German uh, study. And some people, obviously, it's from what I uh, have discussed with other neuroophthalmologists or ophthalmologists, they don't really uh, accept it. I mean, what is your take? Yeah, so, uh, so, with for full plasticity, yeah. Plasticity. so for full disclosure, I was actually on the advisory board for the original group that was looking into Nova Vision. Um, and so I had great expectations that it might prove helpful. Um, I think that there is enough evidence that therapy of that sort may help it's the mechanism of help that I think is the most controversial. I think people do better, not great, and they will never be able to drive if they're illegal to drive to begin with. They may do better. And so the question is, is it because of attentional, you know, therapy is good, okay? So do we increase attentional mechanisms? Do we actually have plasticity enough that we change the visual field? Or are people doing more likely saccades into their blind hemifield? Those are all the possibilities. I think more and more that it's unlikely that this is true neuroplasticity. But I do believe that there probably is a tensional mechanism that it's not just saccades uh, being done. But whatever, paying attention to your blind field is helpful. It's controversial. Any more questions for the audience here? Also, in uh, if someone is connected to Zoom, you can write your questions in the chat uh, and you can read it. Yeah, oh. sure. Let me ask you one more since nobody else volunteering. Sure. What about the central retinal artery occlusion that you mentioned? I mean, I know I've read these papers by McGrory, this young, yes, you know, from Duke. Now he's at Duke, with, yeah. uh, you know, with uh, the recommendations, etc. But it seems that we need to bring these patients very quickly in because I don't think that, you know, as you mentioned, 24 hours or 12 hours are going to, to do anything. I mean, but the problem is that the, if these patients go first to the ophthalmology, it's going to be a major delay. So I think yeah. we should actually expand the, let's say the teaching to the, the population. The same th thing that we do here with brain, no, the, uh, you know, be fast and come quickly to the ED. Maybe you are so correct. To... You are so correct. And remember, be fast was first fast. It didn't even have the eye in it. It got balance and eye later, much later. So it's not just the eye care specialists, it's the patients themselves. You are correct there. They're, I have a whole lecture on, on this topic and it, it require, if we're gonna be able to do anything, it requires everybody knowing where these patients need to go and how fast. And it may involve tele-ophthalmology, it may involve telestroke, but it, we have to, have it recognized. The problem is that this symptom could be a retinal detachment. Someone has to look in the eye and make sure of what it is. You don't want to be giving someone with angle closure glaucoma vision loss or retinal detachment IV thrombolysis, right? So yeah, they have to go through the eye care specialist first. And boy, we've been beaten on them. We even talk at, opto at optometry uh, academy meetings. Hello, thank you so much for your talk. Um, I was just wondering how we can get the photo ED camera. <laughs> is it available? Well, I wish your, is your chairman listening virtually? <laughs> okay, so we, we put, we, we, you know, I would love to say that we've done so beautifully with that. Okay, at Emory, where the study was done, published in 2011 in the New England Journal of Medicine, 
2011, that's more than a decade ago, we do not have cameras in either our ED or our neurology clinic where we did subsequent work which showed how much people wanted it there. Putting that in the budgets and changing behavior in a massive organization is very, very difficult. If you add up the cost of all the ophthalmoscopes and otoscopes hanging in every bay of every ED, which are required to have them, you could put a camera in every ED. They are now less expensive than they were 10 years ago. They're about $15,000 tabletop, about 7,000 for a portable, which is great for the ICU. The problem is that, that then someone steals it. Um, there, the technology, as I told the residents this morning, I have no doubt within five years, the technology is going to get there that a smartphone or a tablet will be able to do it. But we're not there yet. So what do we do in the meantime? We hope we don't have a lawsuit because the lawsuit brings in millions, millions to the venous sinus thrombosis woman who didn't have her eyes looked at and went blind. The fulminant IIH, all of these. Okay, so you dodge the bullet, but ultimately that's what we're going to need. Thank you. Uh, I think this is the end for the uh, grand rounds. Uh, thank you, Dr. Newman. It was an amazing experience with you. Uh, and uh, also, uh, thank you to all the audience for coming here uh, to the first in person in about two years. So we'll see you next time. Take care, everyone.